Sounds like a nocebo. Yeah. Yeah, see, there we go. We can use it as an example. Uh, hallucination, delusion, not the same thing, and, and maybe uh, triggered by nocebo. We'll hit the... <laughs> Recording in progress. Bonus, bonus Jonas audio at the beginning while we're waiting for it to record. And there we are. We are here again. Hey, everybody, all you listeners and brainiacs out there. Really uh, glad to have you guys join us. We have a fascinating topic today. Uh, it would be weird if I ever came on and said we didn't. I've, I've never done that before. But, you know, maybe, may, maybe there'll be a day in the future where I'm like, oh, this is a snoozer, guys. But luckily, as always, I'm able to have a wonderful guest here today, uh, Dr. Mike Bernstein, is um, I, you know what I'm going to take that again? It's Bernstein, <laughs> Doctor Mike Bernstein. I just did that thing with like with the bears, right? The 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 there's a name for that, right? The Mandela effect with the Bernstein Bernstein. So apologies there, uh, uh, Mike. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> You're not the first one, I promise. <laughs> Well, uh, let's see. You are you are the co-editor of uh, the Nocebo Effect: When Words Make You Sick, uh, a book that's come out uh, not too long. I don't have the date right now. It was in March. It's actually not out quite yet. It'll be out uh, sometime mid or late March. It's this March. Yes, I saw March on there, and I thought, oh no, wait, it's coming. It's coming out. So we're getting the cutting edge comments here. Um, fascinated by this idea of the nocebo effect that we're gonna. Uh, dig into, but you, so you co-edited that book and you're also uh, an assistant uh, professor at Brown Medical School. Yep, and I am. What, uh, do you teach a specific aspect of that for the, the school there? Uh, I really don't do much teaching or uh, actually any teaching at, at the moment. I'm pretty much all focused on research. Okay. See, that's, and that's fascinating. I love when we get researchers on the show because you bring a certain knowledge. A lot of, we have a lot of clinicians and people mm -hmm. who come on too. And, and hopefully there's lots of crossover, but sometimes not as much as you'd want. As far as the application goes, the clinicians are the one who should be applying it. But um, I, I always like to start out by giving uh, guests a chance to tell everybody a little bit about their background, where they came sure. from, how they got into this weird, quirky business of studying humans. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, I uh, uh, fell in love with psychology uh, early in my undergrad, and from there, it was pretty clear that you know graduate school in psych would be in my path. And so, I ended up at the University of Rhode Island for my PhD program. Um, originally, I was studying substance use, especially alcohol use, in college students. And I sort of gradually became interested in the topic of placebos kind of over time. Um, my master's thesis involved uh, seeing if you could find a way to compellingly give placebo alcohol actually to people who are underage in a lab setting. So these are people who would presumably know it was illegal to give them alcohol. And yet, could you convince them that you were actually doing so? Um, and so that was sort of the first study in placebos I did, you know, really interested me. And I um, kind of realized I was much more interested in placebos and expectancies uh, and, you know, how the mind can shape uh, your thoughts and behaviors more so, frankly, than I was in, in topics, many other topics related to substance use. So I kind of moved more in the placebo domain. I still apply it to substance use. Uh, but but really, I would say expectations has become my main interest. Hmm. Um, and so that's something that I started doing a lot of in postdoc at Brown. And then when I became faculty here, I'm, you know, continuing that kind of research. And that's sort of the path that that led to the book. That's that is a very fascinating uh, line of study. I got to ask, is it. Did they become intoxicated from the effects or oh. feel intoxicated? Does that was. That, yeah. That so um, we sort of, um, we only gave low, alleged low doses of alcohol. Um, so, you know, it would be very hard to convince someone that, you know, they were drinking a high dose of alcohol when it was a placebo, like they were taking like, you know, five shots of placebo liquor or something. I don't think you're going to get much of an effect there, but at the lower doses, I think around two drinks, one and a half, two drinks on average, something around there. Um, uh, it was around 85% of people, I believed, 
uh, thought that they were having at least some amount of real alcohol, uh, even though many probably suspected it was less than we thought, or you know, a part of them was skeptical. But by and large, the they know majority it's a study, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They know it's a study, but you know, we did many, many things to try to make the um, the deception as as amped up as possible. Um, and you know, this comes. A lot of it came from prior research where you uh, you pour flattened tonic water from real liquor bottles. Um, you have a real bar setting. We spray the smell of like, you know, really low quality tequila all over the room. So as soon as wow. you, you walk in, yeah. uh, put a couple drops of um, rum extract on the top of every drink. So the first sip that a participant would have, you know, you get that kind of bitter, nasty alcohol taste. Um, and then we also had a, a study actor actually in every session. That was one thing we did differently that others didn't do. So there was someone who pretended like they were participants, but in reality, they were working for me. Um, and they had a few lines that they said, you know, oh, my roommate did the study and came home drunk last night. I'm really looking forward to it. And they sort of acted like they were buzzed throughout. So that's yeah. super, super fun. Now, I, and, and very fun. interesting and medically relevant as well. I don't know. I'm glad to hear. I, it's fascinating to hear how you do it. I, I had an image pop in my head of, of research associates just, you know, waiting outside of a liquor store, a, a 7-Eleven, waiting for the kids to see if they're cool, um, buying them. No, not, not really. But that it, it. so when you structure this, it's interesting how that took you towards, as you put, I like the word you used, expectancy, kind of mm-hmm. reactions, right? Which, mm-hmm. um, and, and can I ask too, people out there are hopefully familiar with the placebo effect, which is, uh, and, and maybe this is a good time to define what sure. is, the, what, when does this term nocebo, has that been around for a minute? I, I, it's new for me. I hadn't really heard it very much. Yeah, it was, uh, coined in 1961. Um, okay. so the, the placebo effect refers to, and I'm saying this sort of Generally, this isn't a precise definition, but good enough for now. You know, it refers to feeling better due to the expectation of feeling better. Um, And then nocebo is the opposite, feeling worse due to the expectation of feeling worse. Uh, So, yeah, the term, you know, placebo was a term that's been used. um, Well, actually, funny enough, it's a word in the Bible if you go back far enough. Um, But in the medical context, it's been used uh, let's see, I think since the 1800s, if I have my history correct, nocebo, you know, first coined in 1961, but it was in a paper that really didn't gain much traction at all for quite a while. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a real focus of research for quite a while until much more recently. It's funny, as you say, uh, that definition of nocebo is when I've heard people use placebo to describe the kind of that, that de- the detrimental effects as well. It's usually used correctly, I think, but like so many terms, it, it becomes shorthand for something that there is also a term for, at least mm-hmm. that, that, that might be. And uh, yeah, anyway, but in preparation for this, as I was reading uh, y'all's book, I was also doing a little Googling around about this and finding out, wow, there's a lot out there I didn't know about. I'm that example of that clinician who had not <laughs> come across that research specifically. Um, although conceptually, it's not surprising at all. And I'm really excited that there is, that the study is being done. Uh, you know, you guys also talk about the book Attribution, which is, and Misattribution, mm-hmm. right? Which is a very mm-hmm. related field that I, I bring that into therapy quite a bit when I work with people. Uh-huh. As far as how do what do we attribute things to, uh, mm-hmm. particularly if they're adjusting to new medication or going through a major life change, uh, if I, I've got this diagnosis. Uh, if I was just diagnosed with bipolar disorder, does that mean every single decision I make now I wonder if I'm manic? The answer, yep. the answer is yes, of course. We do wonder that, and and that yep. becomes a uh, uh, tricky to try to fit all that together. <laughs> yeah, and it's really tricky. I think in you know thinking about nocebo because. Um, you know, we get various aches and pains all the time. I mean, you know, how many days do you not have any kind of headache or any kind of bodily pain? And, you know, it's just sort of a part of um, normal functioning and doesn't really mean much in terms of anything really going wrong with you. But if you just start a new med- medicine, for example, you know, you might attribute that headache to the new medicine when really your headache is 
you know, it could be for any of a dozen of different reasons. Yeah. Um, and so that's where misattribution comes into play with nocebo. Yeah. I've seen that a lot with people who are uh, getting out of opioid abuse disorder mm -hmm. and and get off of that. And occasionally, especially if they've had that or a lot of alcohol use disorder for a long period of time, you know, we hit that certain age where aches and pains are aches and pains rather are more normal. And if I've been intoxicated off and on for a long period of time, I might not have noticed some new aches and pains that my body's developed. And then we think, yeah, that's... Oh no, why, why is this happening or something like that? And it's like, actually it's, it's adjusting to normalcy. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. So that would be um, sort of, if you've, or, you're thinking there is if you use substances for a long period of time, that's maybe masked some of your physical symptoms. Then when you come off of it, uh, you no longer are masking it. So you, you feel it more acutely. Yeah, no. And it's actually a, a relapse trigger for many people too, because especially if chronic pain or pain was something or intermittent pain or post-surgery, whatever was a trigger to, to launch that and not to get lost in the weeds there, but, but it's also a reason why uh, a lot of detox facilities now, if they have a more modern approach or are utilizing medical eval much heavier than they used to, as far as not just, is it safe to get off the drug, but you know, what other medical issues might you have and that maybe you didn't know about? Cause also with, a, as you know, substance abuse can lead us to bodily neglect too. But, mm -hmm. but, but that leads into something that I wanted, I thought might be a good springboard is many people, if they hear placebo, they assume they, they put another word in the definition in their mind, which is fake. And that's yep. not really appropriate to say, oh, it's a fake effect. And, and I mean, tell me if I'm right about that first, I guess. Yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it is, and I would phrase it more strongly, it is definitely not appropriate, though I certainly understand why people do so. Yeah. And it it pairs with when people have psychosomatic issues. And uh -huh. it's a big thing. I'm a broken record. Anyone who's ever, you know, talked to me about this stuff or listened to this podcast has heard me say that, you know, we make a false uh, delineation between physical health and mental health. I hear people, even in, you know, medical professionals and therapists do it all the time, right? Uh, or people ask that question, is this is this mental health or physical health? And it's like, well, mm -hmm. the the brain is contained inside the body. That's usually I'm not I'm not a doctor. You can comment more on that. But generally I'm speaking, I'm not a physician either. But OK, you're, yeah. well, you're, you're, you know, you know a lot more about a lot of that than, than I do in that way. But. No, but obviously, you know, the brain is part of the body. So mental health is physical health and uh, issues that stem from uh, that stem from the brain or stem from some of these things, psychosomatic disorders or other things, they can kill people. I mean, you know, they're real. They're very real, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the people are, I think, tempted to, you know, describe things as real when they're visible and fake when they're not visible. Um, so, you know, if you have a broken arm, you know, that pain has the appearance to many of being quote real. Whereas if you have fibromyalgia, um, people might be tempted to call that pain fake. And I understand where that's coming from. Um, but the pain for fibromyalgia is still very real. You know, there are people who you know, might fake their symptoms, but that's different. That's um, saying that you have something happening, which you're not experiencing at all, which is quite different from something happening, but without a real physical manifestation that you can exactly point to of what's happening. So it's a subtle distinction, but it is quite important. And, you know, you unfortunately have people with chronic conditions that um, oftentimes feel like they're not being taken seriously, even by doctors sometimes. Um, uh, and well, that doesn't benefit anyone, unfortunately. Right. right. And, and also can lead to, I guess you could say primary versus secondary. These are terms I'm just making up to apply now, like primarily like the symptoms themselves can cause, uh, serious health problems and even, you know, can even end a life. And then I guess I was saying second, secondary would be actions that stem from that not being taken seriously. If I have chronic pain for years has led to many, many, uh, people ending their life purposefully yeah. as well. So, yeah. 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 I'm not surprised to hear that. What? So why does this happen? What do we know about that? Nocebo, placebo, you know, why? 
and this nocebo, uh, as I tell you, is is more the the detrimental effects from expectation, right? Is that a good exactly. definition? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know, it, it really comes down fundamentally to expectations. Um, you know, these have a large role in our experiences, and there's, uh, you know, I'm no neuroscientist, but you know, people have done some work doing um, brain imaging of people experiencing a nocebo or placebo effect, and you do see activation like you would if there was, um, uh, say, a, a real treatment rather than a fake treatment. Um, it's hard to know exactly why fundamentally it's happening. You know, there's some theories maybe from evolutionary psych that there might be a, some kind of adaptive advantage to this. Um, but it's it's hard to really tease out the why question. Um, and, in, you know, research is often focused more on, I would say, documenting the phenomenon. So they 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 did a study. I think this was from the '80s, if I remember it correctly, um, where they first showed that a placebo can reduce pain, which is no surprising. Um, but then they also looked at what happens when you give someone a placebo, but in addition to that, you give them a drug which blocks their opioid receptors, an opioid antagonist, and they showed that that actually blocked in one case blocked, in some other cases, it reduced the placebo effect. Um, and so that was really important for some of the earlier scientists studying placebo effects, because it really did show that what's happening is occurring at a biochemical level. Um, and it's, you know, it, it really goes back to the, to the, I guess you could say the mind brain connection or mind body connection. Yes. Yeah. And the, well, the elements of the, of the power of the psychological aspect that, that sounds almost crazy, doesn't it? I mean, in a way yeah, it's, it's almost like, science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. So is the brain then, I mean, would the theory of that go along with that? We are sort of activating whatever receptors the opioids would be. And exactly. Would be uh, uh, interacting with. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And other research has been able to look at it more directly, but that was some of the earlier signs that um, of, of that occurring. Cause yeah, that's exactly it. You know, it's just as a real painkiller medication would be blocked by an opioid antagonist. So too was a placebo blocked by an opioid antagonist. And what that provides evidence for is that placebos are actually working the same way on our brain as a real medication, as crazy as it sounds. Yeah. So that's an important, uh, real important differentiation for people. If you find yourself thinking when you hear these terms that it makes people uh, think they're experiencing something, the, the diff, the, it would be better to say it makes people experience something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. You you talk a lot in the things I've been reading. A lot of your guys' work revolves around expectations related to uh, a negative or unpleasant side effects of medication that people may go, oh, I've heard that this will happen either from people or I hear that one little blip on the ad that said this might lead to, you know, whatever, uh, mm-hmm. or maybe even the doctor, you know, uh, and, and so when we have that uh, introduced to us, that has a tremendous effect on uh, how the meds work and how we choose to behave with the meds. It sounds like. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's been a couple uh, landmark studies in that. So uh, one of them was um, they gave statins to uh, patients and some of the time they were told you're getting a statin and other times they were told you're getting a placebo or a statin, but they were in fact getting a statin on both occasions And yet when they knew they were getting a statin versus when they thought it was 50-50, whether they were getting a statin, they had more side effects. Um, And similarly, there's been uh, other work where, you know, if you tell someone about the side effect of a medication, they experience that side effect more than if you don't tell them about it. Is it Um, always in that research, are there ever times where it's a... a fault, a side effect that you should not actually anticipate? Does that been played around with? Oh, interesting. Um, I don't, I cannot think of any examples off the top of my head, uh, but that would be really interesting to look at, like where 
no one would expect nausea to be a side effect of a medication, but you tell someone that it might be and see what happens. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, I, I haven't ethics seen. Ethics are that. dodgy there, I guess, or I don't. But but maybe that's a permissible lie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It would it would depend. It would depend on the uh, the ethics committee reviewing it. Yeah, right. um, that would be a very. I have not seen that hmm. that I could recall. Okay, no, I was just curious about that, but but it, it's. That's an important piece of information that if I'm thinking this will happen, it's more likely to happen. Yeah. Uh, if especially if especially if it's something I would guess that I have maybe anecdotally also heard. I mean, I I know that I run into that. You run into that every day with like family or just people I've talked to. They're like, oh well, you know, my aunt she took this and she grew wings or something, and it's like right. really, ah, oh, I want to take that. That sounds cool, actually. Yes. But, um. And, and that complicates people's choices with their medication uh, prescription. Well, I as think well. you know, and I, I think it might have happened, perhaps a lot with the uh, the the COVID vaccine. Um, you know, to be certain, there were real side effects that people got from the COVID vaccine. But you know, I remember kind of in the early days, there was just this um, uh, very pronounced. You know, all, all the media. Sources were talking about, you know, the various side effects you get from from getting a, a COVID shot and makes you wonder if that made it worse. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I And uh, just to the anticipation of it, uh, the effect that I saw a lot with people is that they wouldn't take it because of that, too. Yes, um, which is another, yes. I guess, and I guess I'm using this this term I I'm throwing out there with primary and secondary, I guess, but so not having the uh, symptoms uh, myself, but anticipating and maybe amplifying whatever reality is out there, um, and, and yep. saying like that second that effect of like, well, I won't take it, which uh, puts people at risk then for for COVID, obviously, yes, more, more risk, however you want to put that, yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Hmm. Um, yeah, and it's it's a real double edged sword, right? Because on the one hand, um, uh, transparency is important. We want people to know what the side effects of what they're taking are. But what do you do when talking about the side effects causes more side effects? Because now you're actually uh, causing harm to patients, and it's not clear exactly how to address that tension. That's that's a, a really interesting part of the the book and the studies you guys have done. And I was particularly, of course, interested in the bit about psychotherapy as well. Mm -hmm. But also you mentioned that with medications. Doctors might be like, all right, now listen. Um, and also, and you gave a few examples in there when it comes to psychotherapy of things that it's like, well, you, yeah, we say, we say that, you know? <laughs> I was like, yeah. wow, yeah. is that, oh, you know, I think one of the examples you give is someone being like, oh, you're going to be fine, could make someone say like, oh, they they think this about me or I'm exaggerating or I'm too sensitive or something versus like other ways of saying it. But, but what way to say what that doesn't trigger some detrimental possibility of the nocebo playing out, right? Yeah. So, the, the, and because it's an edited book, so what this means is that we had um, uh, different folks write a bunch of different chapters. So the psychotherapy chapter was written not by me, but by Cosimo Loker and uh, uh, Helen. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, so I won't butcher it. But um, you know, so they kind of go through how the nocebo could work in psychotherapy and. I think that's an especially important place to think about it because the nocebo effect, placebo effect too, but here we're talking about nocebo, um, it has so much to do with how information is communicated with people and perhaps especially how information is communicated with people when they're in a vulnerable state. And what is psychotherapy if not talking people to people who are vulnerable, vulnerable you know, and communicating for an hour with the patients? Um, so yeah, it's something that therapists, I think really would benefit from thinking about quite carefully. And, you know, I, I'm sure to a certain degree, they know it even just sort of intuitively that the manner in which they communicate makes a difference to their patients. Um, but yeah, you know, I think you said the example of, of telling a patient, like, I think you're, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. Um, you know, you can see how 
Well, for, for some people, it might be therapeutic um, to have a reassurance like that. But for other people, that's probably going to induce a nocebo effect of, you know, oh, you're you're telling me I'm fine. I don't feel fine. You know, you're you're minimizing the symptoms that I'm having. I have all these problems going on. And so, uh, um, yeah, that's that a message we mm-hmm. a message that uh, and I'll speak as a practitioner as well as a consumer of mental health services myself. Yeah, we get that enough, right? Just from day to day around the world, where people, you know, oh, you're fine, you're fine. And sometimes even just individuals, non professionals, mainly, um, and sometimes professionals will say things that are invalidating like that and do create that. Oh, well, I've always maybe spent years and years thinking I'm just nuts and broken. And and now this person has said, and, and I think with that intention usually is to say, well, you're not as broken as you think you can recover. And sometimes mm-hmm. that's said in a way, though, that mimics what you hear in the world, which is just, ah, just knock it off. And yes. not yep. what the professional means, but you get enough of that message just, just out in the world anyway. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And I would say, you know, it's oftentimes given by people who are really trying to be supportive and think that they are. Um, so it's not, it's not something that's said in the spirit of being mean, but um, it, it it just goes to show you that the way you communicate, even when you're trying to help, can still sometimes backfire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, as you put it, this is more about drawing out the reality of this, and it seems like that leads naturally to the stages of what do we do here? How do we kind of try to avoid this? As mm-hmm. you mentioned, there's inadvertent harm that's unquestionably being done. With this dynamic, um, mm-hmm. has has that led to, or or to any kind of focus there of how do we sort of train for this, practice for this? Yep. What mm-hmm. do we do? Yeah, um, so uh, there's a chapter in the book on what um, uh, doctors can do to reduce nocebo, and probably some of the lessons could be applied to therapists too. Though it was maybe more so for doctors, but uh, a couple of strategies. One would be something called authorized concealment, which is uh, you might have a patient and, you know, you could tell your patient, I'm going to give you this medication and there are potential side effects to the medication. If you want, I'll tell you what those side effects are right now, if you prefer. However, by telling them to you, you might be more likely to experience them. So, If you would like, I could just write them down and give them to you and you can only open it if you think it becomes relevant, or I can only tell you about some of the really serious ones where you would need to seek medical attention for. And so that's a way of getting around, uh, like I said, the tension between transparency and trying to maximize benefit for the patients because the patient is fully aware that you are not disclosing some potential symptoms and they would have to agree to it. It wouldn't be ethical to do this without the patient's consent. <laughs> right. At least in the United States, there are other cultures where I think it would be considered ethical. But there are yeah, other practices and 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 thing. I just watched the farewell the other day. But um <laughs> anyway, plug for that that movie out there. It occurs to me that that could be very useful. It, it's a, it's like a step further. Well, I got to tell you, do I tell you the side effects just because of fear of liability or do I tell you the side effects because I think it's going to help? I would go so far as to say in most cases, there's an element of both there, right? Yes. But yes. this is like adding another layer of informed consent as well. It's just an extension, I guess, of saying, oh, by the way, there is this thing called the, you know, maybe you want to know about this dynamic that people experience yep. more that's assent, whether or not they use the word nocebo. And, and I know many people that I've known that would definitely benefit from, you know, some one of the solutions you're saying, or maybe even just here, I'm going to give you this track, what you're experiencing and, and let's meet and yep. we'll talk about whether or not that could be a side effect or not. Yep. If I tell you all of them, it, you know, it may, but I will, if you want all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And th- there's also a version of this where, and this was mentioned by other folks in the book, this isn't my idea where you could like tell a family member what the possible side effects are. And then, you know, the patient talks to the family member about how they're feeling. And then if they, mention certain side effects that are a little more worrisome than at that point, the family member can say, okay, we need to tell the doctor what's going on. Um, uh, The other thing that can be done that I'll mention is, um, and this really comes from cognitive psychology, I would say, is that the way in which 
the frequency of side effects are presented can be changed. So typically what a doctor would be tempted to say, or really maybe not so much a doctor necessarily, but communication is often presented in the way of say three in 10 patients who take this medication will have nausea as a side effect. Um, well, instead you can say seven of 10 patients don't have any nausea when they take this drug. And so you're communicating the exact same information, but framing it in the positive way. Um, the research is a little bit mixed, but there's some indication that that will reduce the frequency of side effects compared to uh, the other kind of framing. That's 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 a, that's a really interesting technique. And it reminds me of a prescriber when I was being uh, put on a certain medication that <laughs> – uh, there was a potentially, and it could potentially be a side effect that wasn't life threatening, but it could mean you couldn't take the medication um, mm -hmm. anymore. And and when my prescriber described that to me, the way he did is he said, "So you know the numbers on this are it's very infrequent, uh, but it is serious if it does happen. So you need to be aware of it." And then he said the the way that the statistics break down, and he he said something about them, but then he put it in the terms of that means if everybody in this county that we live in and the next county over, if every single person took it, we would expect five people to have or something like that. It, it, was, yeah. it was it was very interesting though when he put that because it right away made me go, I was aware but not worried. <laughs> Does that make sense? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, that, and that makes a lot of sense, especially if we factor the placebo side of this, because is there a chance that we could avoid a side effect by not expecting it? <laughs> uh, or or is it just, you know what I mean? And once again, people go back to this idea of it being manufactured, like like it's a delusion and, and you're really, we're really talking about, no, it's actually an experiential thing that happens. Uh, yep. So, yeah. Wow. That puts a whole new wrinkle on do no harm and do m more good. That's uh, that, that one's not part of the Hippocratic oath, but uh, <laughs> that second one I think is inherent to it. <laughs> yeah. How much are you seeing with uh, modern research? A lot of times people try to take into account cultural differences and, re and this is also, man, this is a whole huge minefield of subjectivity to the, the individual, right? Not just culturally, but their own experiences, their own other mental health aspects, other uh, different things. I, I would imagine a lot of subjectivity. But has there been work done to try to address that subjectivity, uh, culture, or person? Yeah, yeah. So the, the cultural stuff around nocebo is really interesting. And, um, oh, uh, you know, one way to look at it is um, – uh, what's been called mass hysteria events. Now it's called mass psychogenic illness. And, you know, you can sort of see how that plays out in different cultures over time. Um, for those who don't know what that means, it basically refers to groups of people who become ill and there's no identifiable cause of what the illness is. Now it's tricky, right? Because you can't prove, you can't, prove with certainty that there's nothing that did happen. All you can do is say, well, we really looked and we just can't find anything. And so there's probably no organic cause, but we can never know that really for certain because you can't prove a negative. Um, but anyway, over, over history, there's been, you know, these fascinating examples um, cross-culturally of groups of people who become ill um, in the Middle Ages. Um, there are people who had laughing fits that they would laugh so hard until they would just collapse from exhaustion. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a famous incident from the 1960s in the U S of uh, people who worked in a textile mill and they believed that they were being bitten by bugs that were coming in. Um, you know, many people got really quite sick, ended up in the hospital, all of, the whole nine yards really. And there was no evidence of the bugs. Um, there's been outbreaks in schools. That's actually quite common. Um, uh, I actually think funny enough, uh, uh, Walter Brown and I wrote about this in psychology today. I think that what happened with the bed bug incident in Paris that you might remember, I actually think that's an, probably an example of mass psychogenic illness, uh, where you had a lot of people really believing that they were bed bugs that were biting them. 
uh, and there was no evidence of any kind of rise in wow. bed bug prevalence, um, even though, you know, there were reports all over the news around late summer, early fall of, you know, the bed bug epidemic in Paris, which then spread to other cities, allegedly. And, you know, the mayor of Paris said something like, you know, no one is safe from bed bugs. Um, and, <laughs> you know, you can yeah. see how there was an explosion. Uh, Every I remember and I don't remember the timing of this, but there was. A lot of uh, uh, talk about bed bugs really intensely, and people yep. still. And maybe this is a good practice. I don't. I don't mean to say people still flip over their mattresses in hotels and look for yep. signs of bed yep. bugs. And if they come home with you, you'll never get rid of them. And I think that. Yep. I think I heard of This American Life talking about how they don't even uh -huh. need to eat or breathe or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, in bed bugs, it's 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 a really tough case because. There are bed bugs. I mean, right. and they're oh, horrible, right? And and they are horrible. And like, you know, flipping over your mattress just as a precaution might not actually be a bad idea, just in general. Um, but there is a disconnect between the perception and the reality, and that's, I think, the the better way to look at it. Like, you can't say there's no bed bugs. It's just that there is a perception of them being totally widespread. And while the, there were some, there wasn't really evidence of any more bed bugs this summer than last summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other the other example of mass psychogenic illness that often comes up is Havana syndrome. Um, and you know this is tough because we don't really know what was going on, but there were in 2017, 2018, there were intelligence officers, U.S. intelligence officers that were overseas who became ill with kind of strange neurological symptoms. And, you know, there were speculation of Russia, you know, um, I don't know radio waves that the Russian government was using to um, demoralize them or to wreak havoc or, you know, whatever it is. And um, we really don't know what the full story there is is again because you can't prove a negative but no one could figure out any sign of an organic cause for the illness and so it's certainly possible maybe even likely that that was another example um of nocebo and the fact that people have trouble even talking about that especially on the individual level where it's mm -hmm. like how do we talk about this without taking away a message that I'm crazy or I'm making it yep. up or whatever. I think yep. that shows that there's still such a, si uh, a stigma about the power of psychology, right? That it's like, oh, are you saying we all made this up? And it's like, no, no, that's not what the term means. That's not what psychogenic means. It's not what to see, but it means that there's another reason, which you'd think if we believed in mental health and we believed in psychology, right? We'd say, oh, another avenue of treatment. Well, here's three things it could be, and we have different treatments for these three possibilities. Let's investigate. Uh, I feel like that's a sign of acceptance and, and understanding of the power of, of psychology. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. You know, it's we can all accept that germs spread illness, and no one's going to dispute that. But it's very hard for us to accept that. Uh, I don't know. How would you put it? Um, Illnesses can spread socially as well. Yeah. And it, when we take that, that I think anybody who has struggled even just with depression or anxiety or any of those things or ADHD symptoms has had people who do the same thing where it's like, oh, is that real? And it's like, oh, yeah, you just smack a kid and he'll get that. And there's no ADHD. Great. You know, or whatever. There's, Problem solved. People still um, like to make those jokes. Right. And and as if yeah. they're real. Yeah. And it reminds me, too, of, um, and now this is a while ago, so my memory is a little fuzzy, but the um, uh, the TikTok Tourette's um, contagion that spread during COVID, I believe, uh, where there were, God, I hope I have my details right here, so I, I could be mistaken. But, go for it. I'm not familiar, so. Okay. I, go, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, your, your listeners can send me angry emails if I'm misremembering, <laughs> but. Um, I'll put it in the show notes. Don't send it to me. Yeah, there we go. Angry emails here. Um, <laughs> uh, there were social media influencers that posted videos of themselves with Tourette's um, having tics. And you saw sort of an explosion 
in Tourette syndromes among young people during that time. And, you know, people kind of, I remember people were looking at that of sort of, a, oh, kids these days, how crazy are they? And it's like, oh, no, you're drawing the wrong message here. You know, that um, it's just happens to be that now is the era in which social media hit. But if social media were around 80, 90 years ago, kids from the early 1900s would be doing the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Where we excel at gaslighting the previous generation. Uh, we all get to an age where it's like, yeah, those kids, right? I mean, it seems like generationally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, do you mean do you mean gaslighting the current generation? A current uprising generation coming up. Yes. I just mean old versus young, you know, our generation. Yes. Is, yeah. But yeah. it's absolutely an interesting dynamic that I think we really are just getting long, long-term long data on now, right, is the effects of social media. And this, boy, talk about uh, an explosion with placebo, nocebo, self-diagnosis, all of those things. Yeah. At the same time, I know a lot of, I mean, I'm here on a pod, I'm, I'm making a podcast, right? And uh, I'll throw up a video here and there when I remember that I have an Instagram channel, which uh, listeners out there, uh, you know, uh, know that I don't do that very frequently, probably, if you've checked it out. But, uh, but you know, so I think the the dissemination of accurate information in this has never been higher either, right? And mm -hmm. I know tons of people that have been like, wow, I manage my ADHD so much better and my shame has gone down because of – who are legitimately who are diagnosed, treated, have – and and then they come across like this TikToker who is why wow, that really helped me organize my day in a way that's meaningful to me. Um, mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it's like, but you know, if every third TikTok is how to self diagnose with something, then we're going to see an explosion of of those experiences, actual symptoms, as we're saying, not just you're wrong. It's like, oh no, you might not actually have the, uh, the whatever. And boy, this is this gets murky, doesn't it? Trying to sort all this out <laughs> as we're talking about. Yeah. Well, it's. I think what's so challenging about it is social media is a vector of, um, you know, information exchange like no other medium really is. And it's well, not really information exchange. It's exchange of some kind of interpersonal contacts. And, you know, that can be used for both immense good and immense harm. And I think what you're getting at, if I'm understanding you correctly, is like, both of those things are happening simultaneously and who knows how best to deal with that. That's really tricky. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one of the best ways is for people to be doing what y'all are doing <laughs> with your work, which is getting the research done. And as you explained before, and I'll just say that anybody out there, if you have doubts about the way that people go about this, take the example that you gave when you, you got in a little into the weeds of the uh, alcohol studies, right? And some of those things. People are very, very good at figuring out ways to measure things that that if you're not a researcher out there and you don't know that that aspect of the field, um, it, do, so, do some digging into where those things are done because they're very effective at finding information oftentimes and trying to find it. Uh, of course, with human beings and social psychology, we cannot actually have a complete laboratory experience. Uh, but... You guys out there that are doing the research are very good at coming up with ways to measure things that don't seem like they would be measurable. So don't discount it when you come across this kind of research. Everybody should be uh, aware of it as well because it, it's, it is actively impacting your life. If you wonder if it is, the answer is yes, it is. <laughs> uh, um, I am so grateful for you taking the time uh, to do it. I want you to be able to tell everybody where they can follow your work and a little bit about the book. First, I'm going to ask my recurring question that I ask uh, guests when they come on, especially the first time. Um, do you have any kind of example for people of something that is a way to give back to the community, maybe a nonprofit or a charity that means a lot to you? Uh, anything at all that you'd throw out there? It can be related to this, but it does not have to be. Sure. Um, I don't have any specific charity recommendations. I would, though, I suppose, recommend that uh, People might want to go to an organization called A Life You Can Save. Um, and what that does is it rank orders charities by the ones that have the greatest impact for people. So if people are debating what are good charities, that would be the place I'd probably point them to. Very cool. Very cool. And actually, really important, if you're going to 
get involved with it with a charity or something, it's good to have some kind of way to measure that. I appreciate that. So where do people, uh, what's the best place for them to find the book when it comes out or maybe even pre-order and then tell them also how they can follow your work. Sure. So you can pre-order it now on Amazon. Um, if you just go to, uh, type in the nocebo effect when words make you sick, it should pop up. Um, for my work, uh, you can go to the Brown medical expectations lab, see a little bit more about the, the kind of work in this area. Um, and I, am on Twitter. I don't post a lot, but I do a little bit. And my handle there is MH underscore Bernstein. MH underscore Bernstein. B-E-R-N-S-T-E-I-N. Just so everybody That's correct. That Thank correct. you. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Really appreciate you. Have a, a great rest of your day. And to everybody out there as well, uh, you do as you do too. Have a good day. That's a really good clumsy way to end it. Um, go to uh, dwighthurst.com. Also, I'm adding uh, every day right now that we're under a little construction of what's available. Adding more stuff about the podcast, lots of resources, and some ways you can support the show. A few of which are financial, but many of which are just helping us by sharing and giving some information and feedback. Um, so, really, really grateful for y'all who are out there listening as well. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.